With that, uh, let me um, preview the, the three topics that we're going to cover. Uh, we have um, uh, a little bit of um, uh, a heads up on people who may have paid severance pay, and in that severance pay they may have included uh, Social Security. There may or may not be something there that you're going to hear about that might save you some money. Um, we are also going to be covering an old standby in the sense that it's something we all run into every day, which is leaves either under FMLA or the ADA as an accommodation. And we have a little presentation on something that's coming up in the future, which is basically, are you going to play or pay under the Health Care Act when it becomes effective next year? So without that, let me uh, first ask the final, well, I'm sorry, without that, let's go first, uh, I think Irwin Kratz and Chad Mead are presenting our first topic. Irwin, come on up, and Chad. Chad is much bigger than Irwin, and uh, I- Way better. And, and way better. Um, go ahead. Thanks, Don. So I, I'll just start, start going off, and then Chad's gonna take us on the, on, on the, the initial part, run through this. We, we're calling this play or pay. Uh, you'll, read, you'll hear it as pay or play both ways. I deliberately chose play or pay because the intent is to get you to play. But if you don't want to play, you're going to pay. So with that, Chad's going to start us off, and then I'll pick up from there. All right. I'm going to go right here because I was saying that the, man, the podium, I just feel too much authority and power. With, uh, with that. So my wife um, recently had to do public speaking and I told her, I better grab this thing. I t she gets nervous about it despite the fact that she's a very good uh, public speaker, but you know, she, she gets really pent up about it. And I said, you know, public speaking is great. It's an opportunity. It's one of the few opportunities in life where you can talk to people and they can't talk back. And uh, despite that, you know, she didn't, she didn't take much comfort from it. And I can't take any comfort from it because you know, we're all friends here. So if you have questions, just stop us and, uh, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer. And we're gonna save some time at the end, I think, for a couple of questions if you have them too. So as Owen pointed out, um, this is uh, play or pay. Um, if you want to play, um, an applicable large employer must offer its full-time employees minimum essential coverage that is both affordable and provides minimum value. Um, the IRS released proposed regulations on this stuff in December 30th, 2012, right at the end of the year while we're all still having fun. And so all of these terms, applicable large employer, full-time employees, minimum essential coverage. Oh. There we go, sorry. Um, thank you. Uh, all, of the, all of these have, um, are highly defined terms and we're gonna go over them uh, today and kind of break them down. Um, to pay, uh, an applicable large employer can fail to offer substantially all of its employees minimum essential coverage, or it can fail to offer that, the, these full-time employees coverage, essential coverage that is, provides a minimum value and is, a, and is affordable. And uh, I won't keep you in suspense. This first one, this uh, fail to offer all of your employees coverage is the sledgehammer penalty. As everyone no noted, these regulations are designed to get people coverage. Uh, and, and over and over again, the, the theme will be, we wanna get people in and get them covered. And so, um, the penalty uh, can be a an annualized $2,000 per employee penalty for your entire workforce if you don't offer coverage to substantially all of your employees. The good news is you only have to offer coverage, you don't have to subsidize the coverage. Um, but we'll get into the nitty gritty of that later. So um, the pay and pay requirements are generally effective on January 1, 2014 for calendar year plans. Most of us have calendar year plans that start on, on January 1, but if you have a fiscal year plan, they'll be um, you know, starting July 1, for example, um, then, then they can apply there. And there's a lot of different transition rules, and I was gonna put more stuff underneath here, but it's really not gonna make sense without the context, so I'm gonna point it out as, as we go along. So, um, which employers are subject to this? Uh, an applicable large employer. Um, uh, an applicable large employer is an employer that employs at least 50 full-time employees. 
during the preceding calendar year. Um, and because these regulations were released so late in 2012, they're not going to make us look at the whole 12 months for 2013 to start it in, in 2014. Um, you, you can use any selected six-month period. Um, and for determining if you're a large employer, um, they're going to look at the control group. So if your company is a subsidiary company of a, of a larger parent company, they're going to look at both the parent and the subsidiary and count all of those employees as if you were one employer to see if you have 50 or more employees. Um, who is an employee? Um, you know, anybody that, um, anybody that works for you, they're, they're casting a large umbrella in the, uh, in the, uh, with the objective to get people in. So people that you ordinarily wouldn't think of as your employees, like temporary employees or summer interns, uh, they're going to count if they're your common law employee. And basically a common law employee is, you know, if you can tell them what to do and how to do it, they're, they're going to be counted against you for purposes of this of this 50 employee rule. So um, this is a little bit different than, a lot, than, than you may think because a lot of employees that typically don't show up in, in your benefit plans that aren't eligible are going to be counted if you're getting close to that 50 employee standard. So uh, uh, you know, how do we count, how do we count full, full time employees? When I was reading over these rules, I told everyone this the other day, but it reminded me of a clip from Dumb and Dumber when Harry and Lloyd pull up and they, they get out and be like, oh gosh, we've been looking for, looking for jobs all day. I can't believe there's not a single job in this entire city. And Harry says like, yeah, unless you want to work 40 hours a week. <laughs> and uh, and uh, well, somebody at the IRS is paying attention because a full-time employee is, works 30 hours a week uh, uh, under the, the rules. So you've got, um, if you're thinking, okay, well, great, I'll just have, I'll just have part-time employees, and I can skirt these things. No, you've got full-time equivalents too. So a, a full-time employee is an employee that works 30 hours a week for the month, or 130 hours for the for the whole month. A part-time or a full-time equivalent, you're just going to count whatever hours they they do work and divide by 120. So, for example, if they work 60 hours in a month, divide by 120, they count as a 0.5 employee um, for determining these things. There's an exception for seasonal workers. So if your, your workforce is under 50 for the whole year, but say at Christmas time, you bring on a bunch more employees and that puts you above 50, as long as the seasonal employees only put you over 50 for, for four months or, or less, you can, you can take them out of the equation for determining whether you have uh, 50 employees. Um, how do we credit an hour of service or how do we count an hour of service? Well, if you work an hour of service, then it counts as an hour of service for hourly employees. The additional gloss here is that um, anytime that you don't work and that you get paid, um, you got to count that too. So if employees are off for, for jury duty or military duty, um, leaves of absence, you've got to count that. Um, and the IRS, uh, and actually one of the, the interesting things on this is disability because you're going to have people that you're going to be paying uh, that, that go on disability and eventually they're going to stop being your employee at some point. The IRS is aware of this issue. Uh, these regulations right now are, pro are proposed regulations, uh, but they, there's nothing on that yet, but, but more to come. Um, so for salaried employees, you can count actual hours of service, but uh, Probably not going to do that, uh, uh, our, or use our equivalencies. Um, you have to count hours of service. These are the two ways to do it. our equivalencies or actual hours. The hour equivalencies under the player pay rules are a little bit different than what you may be used to under ERISA um, for, your, for your 401k benefit plans. Um, under the 401k plans, you can credit 45 hours a week or 10 hours a day. Uh, here, we're going to do eight hours a day or 40 hours a week. So if I don't want to count hours for these salaried employees, you know, if they work four hours on a day, I give them eight hours. But, you know, the, the IRS is really um, watching out for ways that people can get, a, get out of, uh, of, of providing coverage. You know, you can't use these, these uh, equivalency rules to, 
to, to get around it or to substantially understate what, what somebody would do. So, for example, if you have a full-time employee that works three days a week, 10 hours a day, you know, you can't just say, great, I'll, I'll, I'll give him eight hours of, of credit a day and he won't be a full-time employee. No, that's, that's not how they work. So, what about rehired employees? We'll look at that later. They taught me that little thing in law school. It's called building suspense. It's technical, legal. It's, uh, well, anyway. Um, so are you an applicable large employer? Um, you'll you'll uh, take all of your full-time employees, which again, work 30 hours or more a week, and, and your full-time equivalents, and you'll add them together for each month, and then you'll combine them all and divide by 12. And if you're 50 or over, Congratulations, this stuff applies to you. And if you're 50 or, or if you're 49 or under, congratulations, it doesn't apply to you. You don't have to worry about this stuff. Enjoy the Danish. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, not gonna apply. Incidentally, uh, because of these full-time equivalents, you'll get some fractions, you round down. So if you have 49 and a half, you actually got 49 employees and not, and not 50. So um, that's, that's how we determine whether, whether these rules apply. Now the full-time employees, as I, as I pointed out, to, to get a pass on the sledgehammer penalty, I have to offer substantially all of my full-time employees health care coverage, and substantially all is like 95%. Um, but we're going to determine full-time employees a little bit differently for purposes of the penalty. Uh, um, we're going to do a little bit differently than for, for purposes of determining whether I have 50 employees. So we're going to ignore the full-time equivalent um, thing that I just explained. Um, the applicable periods for determining a, a full-time employee are going to be different. Um, and your, your full-time employee is going, to be, uh, is going to be calculated based on your company and not on the combined subsidiary parent company. So we're going to, for purposes of the penalties, we just look at, at, at your own company. Um, and here is where these rules get, get pretty tricky. Uh, if, if, if you're a variable hour workforce, I'm gonna go over these rules and give you the main rules, but there's more to it and you're gonna wanna look at it more in depth because especially with this transition, um, they can be a bit tricky, but I, I just don't want to get too bogged down. So for new employees, if, if, if you hire a new employee, you reasonably expect that they're going to be a full-time employee, great. They're part of your, you, you got to offer them coverage if you want to play. Um, and you don't have to do it on day one, though. You have 90 days, uh, but after the end of 90 days, you got to offer them coverage or else you're subject to the penalty. Um, for ongoing employees and variable hour employees, you know, if you have a variable hour workforce and you have employees where you hire them and you say, gosh, we don't know if they're going to be full-time employees because they're going to work 20 hours this week, 50 hours next week, no hours, you know, we can't tell. The IRS uh, wanted to make sure that we, we didn't do it on a monthly basis. We didn't have people going in and out of the exchanges and uh, in and out of coverage. So they've developed um, measurement periods. You can have a, a period of time where you can measure or test whether somebody is going to be a full-time employee or not. And these measurement periods, it's a, it's a standard measurement period. That's the term the IRS uses, but it's basically just a, a testing period to find out whether you've got a full-time employee. The, the testing period can be at least three months long, or it can be between three months and 12 months long. Um, and it has to be uniform and combined on a, uh, and applied on a con consistent basis. So if, for example, we choose a 12-month testing period, at the end of the 12-month testing period, then comes a stability period. The stability period has to be at least as long as the measurement period, but at a minimum, it has to be six months. And this can pr pr produce some weird results if you do a three-month measurement period and a you know, then you would have to have a six month stability period. But the stability period is basically your coverage period. So I'll test you in our, in our example for 12 months. 
are you a full-time employee? Yes, hey, you're in the plan. Now we've got the stability period, and it doesn't matter how much you work in the stability period. In, in our example, it would be 12 more months, and whether you drop below that or not, you're going to be treated as a full-time employee who must be offered coverage uh, to, to, to play. Um, to add an additional layer of complexity on these things, uh, there's an administrative period that employers may optionally use, uh, up to 90-day administrative period. Um, and basically, this is like an open enrollment period. Um, now, if you hate yourself, you can use different measurement periods for different categories of employees, such as salaried and hourly. I mean, if you, if you like administrating uh, stuff and, and, and keeping track of things, then, then, then that's for you. But uh, like I said before, there are a lot of different things that you can do here. OK, now that the suspense is built, Enough. What about rehired employees? I know you're all wondering. Rehired employees, um, basically the general rule is if I've got a full-time employee and he gets rehired back in, he's going to come back in as a full-time employee. If he's not a full-time employee, he's going to come back, come back in. And again, this is kind of an anti-abuse rule because if I've got somebody that's in their stability period, they've been determined to be a full-time employee, uh, you know, and they quit and come back four weeks later, they just get right back into their stability period and it keeps going the, the way it had gone before. With the exception of if there's a if there's a twenty six if there's a twenty six week break, then I can just treat him as a new employee, restart the measurement periods over again, restart restart all the testing over again. But again, this is an anti abuse rule because the IRS didn't want somebody saying, Okay, well we'll have a twelve month uh, you know, measurement period, and then we'll just fire them at month 10, <laughs> and, you know, and then rehire them and start it over again. Now, that's not how it's going to work. Um, there's also this rule of parity, which, which basically says that um, if they're gone longer than uh, the time they worked for you, that you can treat them as a, as a, a new employee. So, uh, you know, for example, if, if, if an employee worked for you for two months, quit, was gone for three months, then they can be a then they can be a, a new employee. This is for employees that are at, for, uh, gone for less than 26 weeks. Special rules apply to FMLA leave. Um, there's a special rule, as I noted before, your measurement period or your stability period needs to be as long as your um, measurement period. But because they release these regulations so late, they realize some people are going to want a 12-month measurement period, and um, they're not going to be able to do it because they haven't been able to digest these rules. So there's a, a, an exception for 2014. You can have a six-month measurement period followed by a 12-month stability period for 2014 only. Um, there, there are some examples there. But uh, OK, so. The sledgehammer penalty. I must offer um, minimum essential coverage to at least 95% of my full-time employees and their children, or if greater five full-time employees. There's another penalty if I offer coverage and it's not affordable and it doesn't provide minimum value. Owen's going to talk about that later. Um, it says 95% here. If you're if you're going to play, do 100%. I think the 5% is going to be for a margin of error because you're going to have somebody that just kind of forgets about how the stability period works or you know they're going to say oh well joe was a full-time employee last year but his hours have really dropped so we don't have to offer, offer him coverage in in year two i think that that's what the why we have 95 percent and the, and the reason we say this is because if you try to design your plan to offer to 95 percent of your employees all it takes is one employee that should have been offered coverage, that didn't get offered coverage, uh, who, who qualifies for the for the for the ta for the exchange, goes to the exchange, and then and then the penalty applies based on your total employee count. So you really don't want to don't want to dink around with it. Um, you've got to offer minimum essential coverage. Um, the IRS has released rules that say, hey, these, these plans will provide minimum essential coverage, employer-sponsored coverage, um, you know, Medicaid, Medicare, TRICARE, all, all these. But you know, em employer-sponsored plans are, are going to provide 
minimum essential coverage. And I know what you're thinking. Great, I'm going to offer a dental plan, and I will, I will have satisfied health care reform. Well, the IRS is, is a step ahead of you. Um, they say that certain specialized plans don't count as, as employer plans, and, and here's a list of all of them, but accident or disability plans only, you know, my limited scope dental plan, uh, uh, supplemental stuff. Um, what is minimum essential coverage? You know, the, the health care rules um, require health plans to provide essential health benefits. And here's a list of all the stuff that you have to provide under those plans uh, if you're going to roll them out. Um, and so if you're offering a, a health plan, you're, you're going to provide minimum essential coverage, uh, provided it's not a narrow scope plan. Um, so uh, the, the A penalty or the sledgehammer penalty is if an employer does not offer minimum essential coverage to substantially all its full-time employees, 95%, and any of its full, so if I don't do that, and if any of my full-time employees obtain coverage through an exchange, and is a certi as certified as an eligible for a, a premium tax credit. Um, the employee to be eligible for a premium tax credit uh, has to be an employee who is between 100 and 400% of the federal poverty level, is not eligible for coverage through uh, a government program like CHIP or Medicaid, uh, and um, doesn't get offered coverage from the employer uh, and enrolls through the exchange. Um, and the penalty is calculated on a monthly basis. So annualized, it's two thousand dollars per employee, but you're going to you're going to pay it um, by the month. So it's a, it's one hundred and sixty six dollars and sixty seven cents uh, times your number of full time employees minus the first thirty employees. Um, and this is done uh, separately. It's not done on a control group basis. So if you're subsidiary, we're looking at at yours. Um, Here's, I think, a great slide that sums up all of this stuff that Erwin put together. So you can see that, the, that you're, in for, you're in for even more. Raise your expectations. <laughs> uh, but it, it goes through. It's a flow chart of, hey, is this penalty going to apply? Do I have 50 or more employees? No, stop, I'm done. If, I, if yes, I got to offer at least 95% coverage to them and their, to their kids. If I don't, it's not, it's not automatically triggered. I, one of the full-time employees has to go to the exchange, and they have to, they have to go to the exchange, and they have to be uh, eligible for the premium tax credit. And then if they, they get the tax credit and enroll the exchange, well, then you owe it for that month, $166.67 for every employee that you have. Um, here's, a, here's a little... Uh, Oh, we took out the worksheet. Okay, so so this will guide you through the sledgehammer penalty. Um, there's more penalties, like I said, if you don't offer minimum value um, and, or if the coverage isn't affordable. And Mr. Kratz will explain those to you. Thanks, Chad. Um, <clears throat> so everything that, that Chad just talked about, you can avoid by offering coverage that satisfies these things, uh, these requirements, even if you contribute zero to the cost of the coverage for the employees. So uh, it makes no sense to not offer coverage that satisfies this. If you, it, it makes no sense to me at least. I can't think of why any employer would opt entirely out of this and say, I'm just not going to do anything. Because you could just go to an insurance company and say, let's get a policy that satisfies this. I'm going to offer it to all of my employees. And they pay 100% of the premium. And you will avoid this penalty by doing that. But that doesn't get you out of. Uh, all compliance. <clears throat> so this, the second penalty, and uh, I, I, you know, Chad just um, sandbagged me by coming up with that catchy phrase, uh, the sledgehammer penalty, because I don't have one for the, uh, a similar catchy phrase for this, but maybe you can think the, uh, <laughs> the uh, meat cleaver penalty or something. So, um, so to avoid, to, once you jump through that first hurdle of offering the coverage to all, to all of your full-time employees or substantial all of them, um, you're not done. You still need to, to, to avoid a second penalty. The second penalty, you need to offer all of your full-time employees the same minimum essential coverage, but it has to be 
uh, affordable and provide minimum value. So we're going to talk about what those two, uh, what those two things mean. So what does it mean to provide minimum value? Um, the, 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 in the exchanges, uh, many of you have probably heard about the, the, um, the metal, metal levels, bronze, silver, and platinum. And those, those levels of coverage basically are determined by what percentage of the, co the full cost of the coverage and the benefits is paid by the, uh, by the participant. And when you add up the actuarial cost of, of the premiums of buying the policy, of paying the deductibles, of paying the co-pays, and all of the cost, which obviously is going to vary slightly from person to person depending on what their actual experience is. But when you add all of that up and you do some actuarial analysis on it, you can come up with it provide, if it provides at least 60%, um, if the plan pays at least 60% of the total of the allowed costs of the benefits provided under the plan, then it, then it will satisfy this minimum value. So in other words, you, you can't go out and, and have a plan that covers all this wonderful stuff, but you know, it pays 5% of the, of the cost, uh, it reimburses 5% of the cost of going to the doctor or having a surgery or whatever it is. Um, and uh, right now, there are no regulations on what that is going to exactly mean with respect to determining whether your employer coverage meets the 60% the 60% requirement. But the um, but HHS has put out a calculator, um, an online calculator, uh, and actually there's a version of there's a copy of it in a, an Excel spreadsheet in the uh, drives that you all have the thumb drives. Um, so you can take a look at that. It, it does all the math, and you've got to enter all the features of your plan, uh, the deductibles and, and the co-pays, and a whole lot of features it guides you through. And it does the math, and it tells you w whether it provides um, minimum value. Uh, the, the, and, and we think there's probably going to be a similar, or maybe the same checklist will come out for purposes of determining, and, and that'll be issued by the IRS, for determining whether your coverage is is uh, minimum, meets the minimum value requirement. Um, then the IRS is also going to put out some design-based checklists, which will make it even simpler. Uh, you know, does your plan do this? Does it do that? Does it do that? Check, go, and you'll be able to work through and come out on the other end without doing math to determine whether you comply. Um, and then there's also provision if if you want to, uh, if you if you get down to uh, some plan design that doesn't fit into these checklists or into the calculator, you could get an actuary to actually do the math. Uh, I think that's unlikely to be done by very many people. Uh, HHS estimates that 98% of individuals that are currently covered by employer plans have coverage that provides minimum value. So it's not likely to be a real pressure point on a lot of people initially. Um, <clears throat> so that's minimum value. Now the second one is, is whether your coverage is affordable. Remember, to get out of the first penalty, your coverage doesn't have to be affordable at all. It can be. It can. You don't have to provide any payment or any of the cost of uh, get covering the, the the of buying the coverage. Um, <clears throat> to determine whether coverage is affordable, the Act says that that it cannot cost the individual more than nine and a half percent of their adjusted gross income. Now, obviously, you don't know what that is because you don't file their tax returns. So for purposes of determining whether the employer's coverage is affordable to their employee, you, you're going to take the individual-only coverage, first of all. Not family coverage, not individual plus one. It's individual-only coverage, the cost of individual-only coverage. And then compare that. There's, they've given you some safe harbors that you can compare that to um, what well, is a substitute for the person's income? Uh, uh, income. Uh, it could be their boxes. Their, I'm sorry, their, their wage. Their wages from box one of the W-2, and that's for the period that we're talking about. So it's for a month, not for a year. It's the W-2 wages for the month, um, or their rate of pay, which would be their salary determined on a daily basis, or their hours hours of work. Uh, T the uh, uh, rate of pay times 130 hours for an hourly employee, or 100% of the federal po poverty level applicable to an individual in that state, in the state. And if your premium costs exceed 95% of that safe harbor amount, then your coverage, 9.5, did I say 95? Yeah. If it exceeds 9.5% of that, that safe harbor amount, 
then your coverage is deemed to be unaffordable. Okay? That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a penalty because there are some other factors like going into the exchange and getting a premium tax credit, which we'll talk about in a second uh, as well. Um, you can use different safe, different, different safe harbors. Those three safe harbors, you can use different ones for different groups of employees. So you might say, for our hourly employees, we're gonna just take the, their hourly rate of pay and multiply by 130, that's the safe harbor we're gonna use for them. But for salaried people, we're gonna use 100% of the federal poverty level, or whatever makes sense for you. Um, <clears throat> there's a note there about how, in order for t to qualify for the tax credit, an individual has to, um, your, your employee would have to get, have coverage that is unaffordable, so fails one of these, these uh, safe harbors, and then they would have to go into the exchange, get coverage, and qualify for a tax credit. When they are trying to qualify for that tax credit, the IRS is gonna use their adjusted household income from their tax return, which is likely gonna be a higher number than the safe harbor amount. Okay, so it's gonna be harder for them to qualify. They might have unaffordable coverage because you failed one of the safe harbors, but it's gonna be harder for them to qualify for the tax credit because they're gonna, the, the cost needs to be 9.5% of a higher number. So you might have people who have unaffordable coverage but don't qualify for the tax credit. So the game isn't up just because you, you, you failed to satisfy one of the safe harbors. Um, so to, to summarize, what, what is that, that, trigger, that triggers this second penalty? It's uh, like the other penalty, it's determined on a monthly basis. Like the other one, it's determined if you do not offer minimum essential coverage, same, same definition of minimum essential coverage. But here, there's one difference to all full-time employees. So there's actually two differences there. One is you have to offer to all, as opposed to 95%. And the second one, you have to offer to all your full-time employees. The first penalty was employees and their children, okay? Um, and I apologize, in some places our slides don't make that distinction, but you'll see on the, on the, la uh, on the last um, slides, and, and from here on it does make that distinction. And then the next difference is your coverage has to provide minimum value, and it has to be affordable. And then if any of your full-time employees, if you, if you fail to do those things and any, or any of the above things, and any of your full-time employees obtains coverage through an exchange and is certified as eligible for a premium tax credit, then the second penalty comes in. So let's look at how you determine what this second penalty is. I'll do it again by pointing out the differences between how you determine this penalty and how you determine the first penalty. Here your penalty is also, I guess, sorry, I'm gonna violate what I just said. The same thing is it's on a monthly basis but it's now $3,000 instead of $2,000, so you've got a higher dollar amount. But the multiplier is gonna be a smaller number in all, in, in all likelihood. It's the number of full-time employees who, are, who were certified as eligible for a tax credit. So that's the reason the sledgehammer penalty is so bad. One person triggers the penalty and, it apply, and you pay it based on all of your full-time employees minus 30. Here, it's only for every employee each individual that, that, you, that you didn't satisfy the requirements with respect to who got coverage, um, you, uh, you, you, you have the penalty. Um, it, and it's also subject to a cap. Using this formula, it's still subject to a cap, which is what your penalty would have been under the sledgehammer penalty if you'd failed on that basis. So it can never be higher than the, first, than the first penalty. It can only be lower. Um, this, this chart does the same kind of a um, question and answer, and this is in your materials, to get, to get the answer to determine whether or not the, this applies to you, the this, this second penalty applies to you. And um, I, I, I want to come back to that. Uh, this, this is actually the last slide. This, this pulls it all together. Starting at the top left, and, and I, you may not be able to read it here, so you go ahead and look in your book, but starting at the top left, uh, did you employ an average of at least 50 full-time employees, including full-time equivalents, during the preceding calendar year? I want to just point out some, let's just start there, and I want to point out again, I, I know this is repetitive, but I think it'll, it's helpful to repeat the, 
distinctions between the different ways you measure full-time employees and, and how you calculate the penalties, it, it's helpful, at least it, it's been helpful for me to kind of understand the, di the differences between these penalties. So I'll just point out some differences here. Uh, when you're determining whether, the, whether, the, act, whether the, the employer mandate applies to you, you have to count full-time employees and equivalents. That's one difference. Once you get to the penalties, you don't count equivalents anymore. Second one is the employees you count here on a control group basis, which is using the same rules as you use for your qualified, your tax qualified retirement plans. So you might be sitting in your workplace with 20 employees, but you're part of a larger, a larger control group. The act is sub you're subject to this requirement. Um, if, if, you did, if, you, if, it's, if you're subject to those requirements, then we get down to the first penalty, the sledgehammer penalty. Distinction here between this and the other one is 95% coverage as opposed to 100% coverage. Like Chad said, don't take much heart in that. Aim for 100% because uh, it's not likely that, uh, that, there's no reason in my view anyway not to aim for 100% because it doesn't cost you a dime to actually achieve 100%. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and so another difference is on the first penalty, when you, you have to offer this coverage to full-time employees and their children, whereas down here on the second penalty, it's only to the full-time employees. Um, another distinction here is on the second penalty, the coverage has to be provide minimum value, 60% or greater of the total cost of the benefits need to be paid by the plan. And another, very, another uh, distinction is, was the coverage affordable? Gets to how much the premiums that you charge your employees to get the coverage. And what we're talking about here, remember on the second penalty, is individual coverage. Not, in, not family coverage or individual plus spouse or individual plus children. Um, then. If you, vi if you violate any of, the, any of these requ initial requirements for the first penalty or the second penalty, then you get over to the question of whether, whether any of your employees got coverage in exchange for the month and whether they qualified for the tax credit. Those questions are exactly the same. The questions are the same whether you're dealing with the first penalty or the second penalty. Did an employee who should, did a full-time employee go and get coverage in exchange and did they qualify for a premium tax credit? And if the answer is yes, then you land up paying a penalty. Um, uh, so how will this all be determined? Because as you're going through it, you're not going to know from month to month whether an employee got coverage through the exchange or qualified for a tax credit. So the way, the way this is going to work is, uh, well, first of all, you're not going to make any of these tax penalty payments on, your, on the employee's tax return. Um, at the end of 2014, all employers are going to be required to file an information return with the IRS that lists all of their full-time employees and describes the coverage that they, that they were provided in 2014. Exactly how that's going to look, we don't know yet because it hasn't been released, but Basically, they're going to, it's going to be reporting so that they can identify who these individuals were and what coverage you've offered to them. They'll use that to administer the premium tax credit because in order for the IRS to say an individual A who comes into the exchange is allowed to get a tax credit, they have to determine, oh, the coverage they were offered at by their employer is not affordable. How do they know that? You tell them. And they're also going to use that to administer your penalties. Um, and in addition to reporting that information to the IRS, you're going to report that same information to your employees. So you're going to tell them, we treated you like a full-time employee, or we didn't. And here's the coverage that we gave you, and it was affordable and, and um, minimum value and all of that. Then the IRS, after the, the deadline for individuals to file their income tax returns, which is where they're going to get, the individual will get their tax credit, or where they'll true up their tax credit with the IRS, and the deadline for you to file your information returns, which will be at the end of January in 2015. The IRS is going to make an initial, they're going to put all that information to, together and say, okay, yeah, we've calculated your penalty, or you don't, if you don't know one, uh, presumably you won't hear anything. Um, 
and then you'll have an opportunity to go back to the IRS and say, no, we disagree with you, you're wrong, here's why, and here's how we calculate our penalty or why we don't have one. And um, then they're, they're gonna make a final determination and demand payment, and then you're off and running. Erwin, I got a question. Um, you're saying that it looks like after the individual has to claim the credit, but before this you've been saying they had to be eligible for the credit. And I'm wondering, I mean, for example, if an employee doesn't claim the credit, you don't have a problem? Good question. Can you pay your employee not to take the credit? I doubt it. The question was, could you pay your employee not to take the credit? I don't know the answer. Uh, I, th I think they actually have to take it, but I, I don't, I, I'm not certain, sorry. Yeah. I call you spanner and the work's done. <laughs> so, um, are there any questions? <laughs> Chad? <laughs> Go ahead. That's a nice loaded question. Uh, nice question. Um, that's a great question. I think there's going to be effects in both directions, more coverage and less coverage. Um, this particular stuff we're talking about, I don't think is going to decrease coverage. There's other things in the app that will encourage, the, the, that will encourage particularly young and healthy people to say, oh, I'm going to take a risk on, on, on not having coverage because the penalty isn't that large. And the cost of getting coverage, if they want it, they'll get a premium subsidy for a lot of them. And the cost of coverage for those in the, in the individual market, not in, this, not in the employer group market, but in the individual market, I, is, I think is probably going to go up significantly, particularly for those young people, because there's a provision in the act that prohibits, that restricts the amount of weight you can give to age, the differential you, you can charge for premiums based on age. So young people's premiums are probably, in the individual market, are probably going to go up. That's my speculation. I guarantee you half of the people sitting here disagree with me. Um, uh, here, you know, we, like, I think it's pretty clear. Most of the, from this, most of the coverage that is offered by employees today satisfies this, th these requirements, minimum value and um, affordability, most. And there'll be some tweaking maybe for some people to, to make sure it does. So, on its own, I don't see a massive ch shift there. The thing that I think will cause more coverage is this, there's a lot of premium subsidies. People, a lot of people who can't afford coverage now are going to get great financial assistance to do it, which means they're going to consume, they're going to buy it, I think. But speculate. Um, question is, is there anything that prohibits, that prevents you from offering uh, a class of employees or everyone a bare bones plan and, and a class of employees a, a richer plan? And, and the answer is yes. There's, there's, uh, dis, there's new rules, well, there's new provision in the Act uh, and prohibits discrimination in uh, insured plans. There's always been, act, there's always been a prohib prohibition on discriminating in your self-insured plans, which is most employer plans. Um, in other words, you, 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 can't have, you can't have benefits that are only available to the highly compensated people, and there's some um, testing that you have to do to make sure that the usage and the actual benefits that are provided aren't, aren't too, out of, too far out of whack. Those similar rules are gonna be implemented for insured plans, so you won't be able to say, okay, let's just offer this, you know, bronze plan to everybody, but to the executives, we're going to have 
the the wealthy the um you know the richer plan i don't think you'll be able to do that uh no i don't think you'll be able to do that anybody disagree and let's talk about it it's okay We have employees that work 29 hours or less without offering coverage. We have employees that are 30 hours or more without offering coverage. And so we're, rather than doing a lot of the measurement periods and look back, they're sort of picking either doing that or doing, you know, setting forward and saying these are my guidelines. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So you're tempted to say uh, anybody who who works 29 hours or less doesn't get coverage and anybody who works 30 hours or more a week does get coverage. That's great. What happens when you've got somebody who's working 40 hours a week and you restructure or they restructure their life and now they're working 20 hours a week? They're, they're still going to be considered full-time during your stability period. And a, a, logical, a logical stability and measurement period is, is 12 months in my view. I think, you know, maybe, maybe one year is 12 months and then the next year is 12 months and, and we just, if they were covered, if they were full time this year, then they have to be covered next year. But they'll they'll, they'll slip through the cracks using using your method. So I don't know the answer. You know, you just fire everyone who's under who goes under. Obviously not. I'm being facetious, but. For, for, yeah, for 2014 alone. Question though, it also, I believe the regs also state that if you have a measurement period that's six months, the um, stability period can only be one month greater than the measurement period for those that do not hit the 30. So is there a safe harbor to address those? Yeah, th there's, th this is, this is the kind of uh, complexity that I was uh, I was talking about with the with these measurement periods. Is that these rules? Um, there's all kinds, of, especially with this transition with with the transition period. There's a lot of different things if you want to do those, and because of the you know a lot of people a lot of people are going to just have aren't going to have variable hour workforces. So. Uh, um, so yeah, it, it, there, there, I'm, I'm sorry, your question again was whether there's the... Well, if, if, if by definition you have a, during the transitional period, you have a six month measurement period, you have a 12 month stability period, one of the other provisions uh, that relates to these measurement periods, and I just wanted to see if, it, if there's a safe harbor that allows you to do this, but it states in the laws that if in fact you have a six month measurement period, that stability period can only be one month greater for those that don't satisfy the 30 hour um, average rule, if you will, when you measure them. So if you were to do the 6 and 12, you might be okay on the transition period, but you would violate it for those that don't hit the 30. So would you have to remeasure those folks again? You're okay for the folks that hit the 30. They'll be happy to be on the 12 months. But for those that don't hit the 30 during the transitional measurement period, what do you do after that 6 months in particular my, my understanding is that for the first year, for the initial 2014, that doesn't apply. Yeah. Uh, we're out of time, but we're happy to hang around and, and answer questions afterwards, but we do need to move on to, to some of the other, the other presentations. Thank you. So this morning I want to talk with you about how we can manage employee absences under the umbrellas of uh, two federal laws, the ADA and FEMLA. And if any of you, and so I'm not talking about your sort of run-of-the-mill absences where somebody calls in and they have a cold, so they're not going to be in that day, or their child is home with a sore throat. I'm really talking about those extended absences that go on for several days, weeks, months, or are unique because they're sporadic over a, long, a prolonged period of time. When we have those, typically there are several laws that come into play, and sometimes those laws intersect. And that can create complications that can, those complications can be fraught with problems for us as employers. And, and for that reason, we often refer to the intersection, at least between FEMLA and ADA, as the two-headed monster, right? And I apologize, we couldn't find a monster, so you've got the two-headed llama today. 
for you. Um, it's, it can be a little bit crazy because there are places where these laws intersect and there are places where they don't intersect. So it's important to understand them and understand when they come into play and when they don't come into play so that we as employers are making sure that we are complying with what the laws require, that we are ensuring that the employees are receiving the full benefits of these laws, and that both we, the employer, and the employees are understanding all of the responsibilities under the law. It doesn't have to be that difficult. We just have to know how to issue spot and how to analyze those issues. So it's, it's my goal that by the end of um, my discussion here today, you all will have a better sense of where that intersection is, what we need to consider, and hopefully it will go back and when you're presented with a similar situation, be able to analyze it, issue spot, and make sure that your company is acting in compliance with the law. So the two laws that we're going to talk about are the ADA and the Family, Family Medical Leave Act. They already start showing some differences when we look at the enforcement authorities for these two laws. For the ADA, that is enforced by the EEOC, right? And so if an employee has a claim of disability discrimination against their employer, they first have to go to the EEOC to get that resolved. And then once they've done that, they can then bring a lawsuit against the employer. Just last year, um, I was looking at the number of EEOC charges in the state of Arizona, and 30% of those charges were disability charges. So it's a pretty significant number, and it's a real issue. FEMA is not enforced by the EEOC. Yeah, that's enforced by the Department of Labor. So if an employee has an issue under FEMA, then they can just go directly to court, or they can go to the Department of Labor. But what you have then is if you have an employee whose issues rise out of the same absence, so they've got a, uh, they're claiming a violation of FEMA and a violation of the ADA, you may be responding to that in two different, totally different agencies with the EEOC and the DOL, or the EEOC and the court. And so you may be able to resolve it in one agency, but still have it continue in another. So it does become a real issue, potentially costly as well. Um, I, I, I had two cases here that I want to discuss. I'll probably just discuss one in the interest of time. And the reason is because they're recent and they sort of show how this interplay comes, um, is associated with these types of absences. Let me talk about the Robert one. In this case, this was an employee who supervised adult offenders. And she was diagnosed with joint dysfunction in connection with her back. She had serious problems. She took femoral leave to get surgery, to have treatment, to rehabilitate. Her, she took her full 12 weeks of femoral leave. When that exhausted, she wasn't ready to come back. Her doctor said, well, she may be able to walk with a cane in about two to three weeks. And then maybe two weeks after that, she'll be able to walk unassisted. This was a problem because one of her essential functions of her job was to do site visits to these adult offenders. And um, because of the nature of the job, it was also important that she be able to sort of leave those places um, quickly if she needed to in the event that there was danger presented to her. So the, the employer fired her. She wasn't able to perform the essential functions of her job with, uh, with or without an accommodation. And she sued. She sued, saying violation of FEMA, violation of ADA. And when the court looked at this, they said, well, there's no violation of FEMA. There's no retaliation here. But let's look closely at that ADA one. Because under the ADA, it may very well be a reasonable accommodation to give somebody a brief extended leave beyond FEMA. But there are boundaries. There are boundaries of reasonableness to this. One is, can that employee uh, give us a date when they can resume the essential functions of their job? And two, is that date somewhere in the near future? In this case, there was no guarantee of when this employee would be able to perform the essential functions of her job. So therefore, whether this reasonable accommodation would help her or not was absolutely unclear. So they didn't find a violation of ADA here. But my point in, in this is how you can see that FEMA can lead to ADA and how you can, as an employer, receive a, a lawsuit that's alleging both. It's just a point of let's be mindful of that every time we have this type of situation. 
So I want to talk about some of the key areas of interplay between these two. And by no means is this an exhaustive list. This is just a list of, of, of areas where we should be mindful of. Let's start with the purpose. If you understand the purpose, that helps you go a long way in terms of navigating these waters. The purpose of the ADA, obviously, is to prohibit discrimination against a qualified individual with a disability who can perform the essential functions of their job with or without a reasonable accommodation. And that's particularly important for today's discussion because discrimination can include the failure to reasonably accommodate um, these limitations of an otherwise qualified individual with a disability, unless, of course, that would create an undue hardship for the employer's business. Reasonable accommodations can be things like intermittent leave, reduced leave, extended leave beyond FEMLA. So we need to be mindful of that. The purpose of FEMLA is a little bit different. It's not about discrimination or discriminating against individuals based on their condition. What it is about is helping employees to balance their work life with their family life. And under certain circumstances, these employees are entitled to 12 weeks of job protected um, unpaid leave in order to attend to things in their personal life. And one of those circumstances, the one I'm focusing on today, is to attend to the employee's own serious health condition that makes the employee unable to perform the essential functions of their job. Now, keep in mind when we talk about purpose, we're using two different terms, right? For FEMA, we're using serious health condition, and for ADA, we're using disability, and these do not necessarily mirror each other. They're slightly different. Sometimes you will have a serious health condition that doesn't amount to a disability, and sometimes you'll have a disability that doesn't result in a serious health condition. And then obviously, on occasion, there may be some overlap. You know, for example, you know, a serious health condition that doesn't amount to a disability could be something like chickenpox, appendicitis, a pregnancy. Those would be things that we would analyze under FEMLA, but not necessarily result in a disability, that we'd have to continue that. Vice versa, there, there are conditions that are disabilities, but don't necessarily result in a serious health condition under FEMLA. Keep in mind, say, a vision impairment or a hearing impairment that doesn't require inpatient care or doesn't require a continuing treatment by a health care provider. So there are differences there as well. What about coverage? Well, the threshold for an employer to be covered under ADA is much lower. It's just 15 employees. If you've got 15 employees, you're covered by the ADA. Thumb was higher. 50 employees is the magic number. And the, the window that we're looking at when we're counting employees is 20 weeks within that current year that this issue pops up or the preceding year. And those 20 weeks don't need to be consecutive. So, so keep that in mind. Eligibility is slightly different as well. Under the ADA, for an employee to be eligible for the protections that come under ADA, we're talking about an employee or an applicant that uh, is disabled who is qualified for the position and can perform the essential functions of the job with or without a reasonable accommodation. It's different when we're looking at eligibility for somebody um, under FEMLA. In that case, we're looking at only employees, not applicants. And they have to meet four criteria. One, they have to work at a location with 50 employees or more, or within 75 miles of such a location. They have to have worked for this employer for 12 months, and those 12 months don't need to be consecutive, right? They can happen over a period of time. And they have to work at least 1,250 hours within the 12 months immediately preceding that request for FEMA leave. Finally, they have to have one of those five conditions present, one of those five conditions that are in that purpose slide. And so for our purpose today, we're talking about, obviously, the employee's own serious health condition. Notice. Notice is a little bit different, too. Under the ADA, if I'm an employee with a disability and I'm requesting a reasonable accommodation, it's generally my responsibility to notify my employer, and I can do that verbally. Um, I say generally because if, as an employer, you guys have reason to know or you know through some other source aside from the employee that would be enough for you to trigger the, um, the um, process of trying to come up with a reasonable accommodation. 
Um, the sunlight, it's going to depend on whether or not that leave is foreseeable or not. So let's say it was a surgery that was scheduled, presumably foreseeable leave. In that case, the employee needs to notify the employer at least 30 days in advance. And if they don't, then the employer can reasonably delay that FEMLA by 30 days. If it's unforeseeable, then the employee under the reg simply has to notify the employer as soon as practicable. And there's no bright line as to what that is. It's been suggested it could be one to two days. But I would advise you, you know, you've got to look at the totality of the circumstances. As soon as practical, practicable means different things um, under different circumstances. And then we've got medical certification. So once we know that somebody's requesting a reasonable accommodation or that somebody's requesting family leave, what sort of medical certification can an employer require from that individual? Well, if it's a reasonable accommodation for a disability, the employer can seek certain medical exams or inquiries if they are job related and they're business necessity. So say, for example, you know, it's, it's me, an attorney, um, and I have my leg amputated. Um, for my firm, for my employer to require me to go through a medical exam to see if I can perform the essential functions of my job would not be appropriate because as an attorney, I'm not using my leg to perform the essential functions of my job. If I'm a production worker, maybe I lift a lot um, and I have a back injury, well, there might be a reason to have a, a medical certification there for my reasonable accommodation to see if, in fact, there is a reasonable accommodation that can be made, an effective one. Under FEMLA, absolutely. An employer can request medical certification when that FEMLA request is related to a serious health condition of either the employee or their immediate family member. And there are certain circumstances where the employer can request a second one and a third one and recertification, if that medical certification is unclear or vague or we're concerned that it's not authentic, there are circumstances where we can, uh, with employee's consent, contact that healthcare provider to get that clarification, to get that authentication. So there's a lot more involved under FEMLA with regard to these medical certifications. Intermittent leave whether or not that's available under ADA, most of these are going to be, yeah, it could be considered a reasonable accommodation, assuming that it doesn't create an undue hardship for the employer. That's a case-by-case -case basis. There's no bright line rule. Everything's going to depend on the circumstances. And under FEMLA, absolutely. Assuming that the proper medical certification is there and this person is eligible for FEMLA, then intermittent leave is something that's going to be available for them. Something that often trips up employers is the difference between whether that intermittent leave is foreseeable or unforeseeable. If it's foreseeable, that employee has a responsibility to work with the employer to try to schedule that intermittent leave in a way that's not going to be unduly disruptive to the operations of the workplace. In addition, if the employer wants to, the employer may transfer that employee to another position that's going to better um, suit the operations for these types of recurrent intermittent leaves. That's not possible if the intermittent leave is unforeseeable. Um, if it's unforeseeable, an employer can't be transferring these individuals. And, and obviously, the employer can't require that that employee work with them on those intermittent leaves. Restricted or light duty. Your ADA is going to be the same analysis. If the medical restrictions require some sort of uh, restricted or light duty as a reasonable accommodation, that may very well be possible if, again, it doesn't create an undue hardship. Under FEMLA, though, it's different. Certainly an employer may offer it, but it doesn't have to offer it. Same for the employee. Certainly the employee, if it's offered, may accept it, but the employee doesn't have to. Because remember, FEMLA is about leave. And if the employee would rather have that leave, the employee is entitled to that leave. He or she can't be forced to take a light duty job in lieu of leave. Fitness for duty, all right, so this person is now ready to come back, or they believe they're ready to come back. Can we require some other sort of certification? Well, under FEMLA, if uh, there are uniformly applied 
practices and policies that apply to all similarly situated employees that take leave, absolutely, you can require that. That should be related, though, to the condition that caused that employee to go on leave. And sometimes we can extend that out to also asking that they are now in a position to perform their essential functions of the job as well. Um, your ADA is going to be just as if when they requested the accommodation. Um, it has to be job related. It has to be related to business necessity. And in those instances, yes, it would be appropriate to seek that sort of certification. And reinstatement. Well, we know FEMLA is about job protected leave. So I'm really talking, and, I, and we need to carve out from that your key employees. This is not necessarily applicable to those key employees, but to all those other employees, yes, assuming they come back from their FEMLA leave within the 12 weeks that they are, are entitled to under FEMLA, then they are entitled to their same job back or something practically identical to that job. Under ADA, you're going to hear the same thing. Yeah, generally they are, but if for some reason that would create an undue hardship, then perhaps there's another job out there, a vacant job that is, they are qualified to perform, and that's not going to create that undue hardship. So let's go through a quick case example. Um, we have an employee, Anna, um, and she is a production worker, and she's called in sick for four consecutive days. She stated that she's got severe back pain. Now, Anna has worked full-time for us for two years, and our company is ABC. We have 125 employees, and she's got an excellent, impeccable attendance record. But on the fifth day, she calls in, and she's still out because of her back pain. It turns out she went to see her doctor, and her doctor says she has some serious back problems. She's got to be on bed rest, and she may need back surgery, and it may be quite a while before she's able to um, come back to work. That's our situation. So let's just do a little bit of issue spotting between these two laws. First of all, coverage. Are we as employees covered under both laws? Well, ABC has 125 employees. We know under ADA, 15 is the threshold. And under FEMLA, 50 employees is the threshold. So we maybe are considered an employee under both laws. How about this employee, Anna? Is she eligible for the protections under these laws? She, let's look at the, the FEMA situation. You know, she's working at a site with 125 employees, so she's met that first criteria of working at a place with 50. She uh, has worked there for two years, so she's met the second criteria of having worked there 12 months. She's a full-time employee throughout those two years, so presumably she's met that third criteria of having worked 1,250 hours over the preceding 12 months before her request. And then the last one is, is there one of these special circumstances that exist? Presumably there is. It's her own serious health condition that prevents her performing, uh, from performing the essential functions of her job. It's her back pain. So she is presumably eligible under FEMLA. Um, ADA is not really going to come into play yet, but we know from the case I talked about earlier and other things we talked about, that may come into play at the end of FEMLA. So we don't want to lose sight of that. How is the leave designated? Well, we are going to designate this as FEMLA leave. We may also, uh, depending on the circumstances, designate it as an accommodation under, under ADA. But it's definitely FEMLA leave because that's going to provide her the greater protection of job protection. She's so going to get her identical job back. The length of leave, well, under FEMLA, she's going to have her 12, 12 weeks that she's entitled to. And if after that she's not ready to come back because she's got continuing treatments or continuing recovery, then we'll need to analyze under ADA whether or not we give her extended leave beyond that or some other form of leave, intermittent leave, to go to rehab appointments or because she can't stand for eight hours a day. Medical certification? Well, she's going on family leave, so absolutely we should and can be requiring her medical certification to support her request for FEMLA leave. If at the end of that FEMLA leave she says she's not ready to come back, let's evaluate that under a possible ADA reasonable accommodation. So we have the situation where she has taken her full 12 weeks of FEMLA leave. So now what do we do? How do we look at that? It's going to depend, right? 
So the first one, she says, yeah, I'm ready to come back. I'm absolutely ready to come back. I'm feeling great. Let's do it. This is, this is what my daughters will say to me, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. This is just fitness for duty certification. Fine, if that's something that we generally do with these employees, let's get that. And she's entitled to the job that she left back. That's done. It's, it's, it's the easiest of the, the top possible circumstances. What if she says, I'm ready to come back, but I still have other issues going on. I still need to continue to go to my therapy every Wednesday, or I can't stand for the full time, the full eight hours a day. I've got some additional things to do. Or um, I can never predict when my back's going to go out on me again, and maybe here, maybe there. We're going to have to look at this as a possible ADA issue. You may need to get a medical exam or inquiries to see whether or not there's an effective accommodation that we can provide to her. And we're going to have to engage in that interactive process with her. What sort of accommodation might be appropriate here? These aren't all of them, but these are some of the typical ones, especially that you would see with a back pain situation. Restricted light duty, res uh, rescheduling, etc. And then, of course, the last one is I'm just not ready to come back. I'm just not ready. And that's more like that case that we talked about at the beginning, where they just couldn't come back, period. We know that under the ADA, um, extended leave beyond what's allowed by FEMA may very well be considered a reasonable accommodation. But there are limits to that. And one is that the employee needs to give us a date by which they can resume the essential functions of their job. And two is durational. That date needs to be somewhere in the near future. So if those two things can happen, it may very well be that she's entitled to more leave. If they do not exist, then it may be that we need to terminate that relationship. But you need to tread slowly because that's obviously a critical situation. That's how we can go through these situations when you get them. And that might not be enough to give you the answers, but really what I want to do is have you think about these things. When you're presented with this type of situation, at least you know enough to issue spot, to go look at the regs, to call us, and we can kind of work through this together because it's often, more often than not, not going to be just limited to FEMA and not just limited to ADA. And even in certain circumstances, you might have the three-headed monster, or the three-headed llama, which is workers' comp involved, right? Those are the issues that pop up. Think about them. You know, it's, it's there's to navigate, but not if you know enough just to pick out the issues when they arise. And if you can do that, you know, first determine which laws are applicable or may be applicable down the road with this particular employee's absence. And once you do that, consider all the overlaps and how you're going to apply them in this situation to make sure that you're complying with the law, that the employees are receiving the benefits that are, they're entitled to under these laws, and that both the employer and the employee are aware of their responsibilities under these laws. And last, I would say huddle. Huddle with your other HR professionals, with your leave administrators, make sure you're handling it right. And certainly huddle with us, your attorneys. If there's something that you're not sure about, you're questioning about, then check in with us. It's, you know, an ounce of medicine is worth a pound of cure in this case. So, so make sure that you're managing these absences correctly. And if you do so, everything uh, will be well and you'll be navigating your way on to the next well, issue. And what we're talking about today is an opportunity for employers to obtain a FICA refund. And the situation in which this arises is if you have paid severance to employees, and we'll only go back to 2009 for this point, if you've paid severance in 2009, 10, 11, or 12, you may have the opportunity to seek a refund of not only the employer piece of the FICA, but also the former employee's FICA piece and then return it to them. The reason this has come up is there was a Sixth Circuit case called Quality Stores that has gone um, well, it may be on appeal to the Supreme Court, we'll know by about April 4th, but there's a good chance it will be reviewed by the Supreme Court because there are conflicting positions between the Federal Circuit and the Sixth Circuit. And right now, um, the Sixth Circuit decision is the one that people are relying on in terms of filing for refunds, and I'll go through for you 
situations in which you may be eligible for a refund. If you paid severance to employees and you meet these four criteria, then under the Sixth Circuit case, you have what's called a supplemental unemployment benefit plan, and you're not obligated to pay FICA on those amounts. Now, we're not advising clients not to withhold FICA, but we are advising you to file for refunds. And the situation in which this would apply is if you paid the employee and included it in their gross income, so it appeared in box one of their W-2 that you issued, you paid it pursuant to a severance plan. That severance plan could have been put in right when you were doing the layoff. It has to have been, let me skip to the bottom point, made in connection with a reduction in force or a discontinuance or a plant closing. And then the last item, it was involuntary. The employee didn't really have a choice. So if you meet those four criteria, you may very well have the opportunity to file for a refund. Why are we bringing this up? Because if you, a lot of employers, as you know, did layoffs, reductions in fourth, 2008 through 2012. And if you paid severance in 2009, you've got a very short window within which to protect your ability to file for a refund. But it's very easy to do that. And what you have to do is by April 15th, you need to submit a Form 941X. It's called a protective claim filing. And if any of you have excuse me, specific questions afterwards, I can sort of walk through with you what you would need to do. But you file this protective claim by April 15th, and then you've preserved the right to file, get the more detailed filing into the IRS once we know what the disposition of this quality stores case will be. If the Supreme Court does not pick up the quality stores case, then we'll see more cases in other circuits coming forward because a lot of employers paid a lot of severance and a lot of FICA and they're going to go, they're looking at it as found money. You need to file this protective filing for 2009 again by April 15th. You have more time to do it for obviously 10, 11, and 12. But if you are filing for 2009, you have to file basically four 941Xs for each of the quarters in the year. Okay, and if you have by chance already filed a protective filing and it has been denied by the IRS, you basically have a short window, 90 days, I'm sorry, you have 120 days within which to respond. The IRS is handling these quality stores filings a little differently than they did the predecessor case, which was CSX where ultimately the government's position was upheld. A lot of companies filed protective filings in 2002 through 6, and then CSX was decided in 2008. The IRS just sat on those protective filings for years. Now, because of the quality stores cases, when clients have been submitting 941Xs, the IRS is denying them and kicking them back because they're wanting employers to have to step forward and um, basically pursue it through the courts. They want them to have more skin in the game. So um, if it's going to go to the Supreme Court, though, the response to the IRS on that would be fairly simple, saying we're waiting to hear what the Supreme Court says on quality stores. So opportunity for a potential FICA refund. And when you do the actual detailed filing, it's much more cumbersome than just saying, give me the employer piece back. There is employee communication filing, um, communication requirements, and in some instances, you're going to have to actually get the employee piece back and send it to them. So easy to protect your claim, not necessarily as easy to actually get the refund if the case is decided in favor of the taxpayer. So do I have any questions? Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>